The story begins in 1973, when a boy named Paul is enjoying the beauty of the night, and suddenly a car stops in front of him. He is forcibly pulled by a group of unknown people and taken far away, to Calabria in southern Italy. One of the kidnappers, known as Cinquanta, calls Paul's mother and demands a ransom of $17 million. The amount is enormous for Paul's mother, and she says she cannot afford to pay the ransom. The kidnapper then instructs her to ask Mr. Getty, Paul's grandfather, for the money. Nine years before the kidnapping, Paul's family lived in an ordinary house, far from luxury. Due to his father's bankruptcy, he was forced to ask for a job from his grandfather, Mr. Getty. Mr. Getty is a wealthy businessman with hundreds of oil companies around the world. However, he is also known to be very frugal. This is evident when he gives Paul a statue and explains that he bought it for $11 from the black market, even though he bargained it down from $19. A billionaire still haggling over a statue priced at $19, knowing the profit from it could be thousands of times greater. Not only that, he's even willing to wash his own underwear and not lose out on paying for a laundry service that costs only $10. According to him, if something can be done by oneself, why pay someone else? His principle has made him the wealthiest businessman and expanded his business around the world. Initially, Paul's parents were reluctant to accept the statue, but according to Mr. Getty, it was a small matter because they were his family. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Getty appointed Paul's father as the executive vice president of Getty Oil, responsible for oil operations throughout Europe. Unfortunately, after a few years, his father became indulgent and sank into a life of drunkenness and drugs, even throwing parties with women. In 1971, Paul's mother, unable to bear the disarray of her family, finally sued for divorce. At a meeting, she made an agreement that she would not take any property, not even the allowance for Paul, as long as she could take Paul away and get full custody. In the following days, Paul lived a simple life with his mother until 1973 when Paul was kidnapped. The next day after the kidnapping, an assistant revealed the incident to Mr. Getty and said that Paul's mother and the police wanted to speak with him. However, seemingly uncaring, Mr. Getty said he was busy and could not be disturbed. Yet, he had previously adored Paul and hoped he would continue the business in the future. However, Mr. Getty is someone who never breaks his principles, especially after Paul's mother made an agreement following their divorce. The current situation is indeed urgent, and there is no other choice but to seek help from Getty. Gail, Paul's mother, continues to try to contact Getty, hoping he can be persuaded because this concerns the life of his grandson. However, she reconsiders her intention after seeing a TV interview, where Getty states he will not take any action regarding his grandson's kidnapping. Moreover, he will not pay the $17 million ransom, reasoning that he has 14 grandchildren, and if he pays once, the kidnappers might kidnap the others. Realizing what her former father-in-law has said, Gail decides to go directly to J. Paul Getty's house alone. Unwilling to meet and engage in unclear debates, J. Paul Getty instructs Fletcher Chase, a former CIA spy now working as a negotiator for all Getty businesses, to accompany Gail back to Rome. Upon arrival in Rome, they are greeted with numerous questions from reporters. Fortunately, a police detective takes them to the office to show them a collection of letters sent by the kidnappers. The news of the kidnapping of the world's richest man's grandson has become an opportunity for other evildoers. So they send letters to Gail from various countries, claiming to be the kidnappers. The police detective revealed that he suspected the real kidnappers were the communists in Rome, and with so many people taking advantage of the situation, he suggested that Gail move to a hotel and they would provide protection. Meanwhile, the kidnappers ask Paul to write a letter to his mother, and if there is no response, they will not hesitate to send pieces of Paul's finger. In the meantime, they start to get close and talk to each other. Cinquanta, one of the kidnappers, wonders why his wealthy grandfather has not yet paid the ransom. Caught up in conversation, Cinquanta forgets to wear his face mask, allowing Paul to recognize him. Cinquanta says that Paul's eyes could be gouged out if he reports the incident to his leader, but Cinquanta feels pity and makes a deal that he will not report the incident as long as Paul does not act foolishly or cause trouble. There was a time when Fletcher Chase found his car had been marked by communists. As he was about to move his car, another car approached him and invited him to come along. 
Upon arrival, a truth is revealed. Those present are Paul's own friends. Paul and they had previously made a deal to engineer his own kidnapping and take a little money from his grandfather. However, they reveal that before the plan started, Paul suddenly disappeared, leading them to suspect that Paul planned his fake kidnapping with someone else. When this is revealed to J. Paul Getty, the old man appears very disappointed and expresses that he had hoped Paul would inherit all his business knowledge, not just enjoy the wealth. At the end of the meeting, J. Paul Getty instructs Fletcher Chase to go to Rome and wait for Paul to return home. In Calabria, one of the kidnappers is seen escorting Paul to urinate while lighting a cigarette. He forgets to cover his face again, and Paul must once again recognize one of the kidnappers. Fearing discovery by their leader, the newly arrived accomplice panicked and raised his gun to finish off Paul. Shots were fired, alerting Cinquanta. Days later, Fletcher Chase received news that the police had found a burned body dumped at sea. The police suspected it was Paul, as a fisherman had seen the body thrown from a car used in the initial kidnapping. However, when Gail and Chase arrived to inspect, she immediately recognized as a mother that it was not Paul. After proper identification, the police learned the identities of Paul's kidnappers. Unfortunately, by the time the raid was over, Paul was no longer there. They eventually learned from a dying kidnapper that Paul had been sold. Cinquanta had planned to sell Paul to a mafia boss who also owned a counterfeit bag factory. Initially, Cinquanta received no payment, but because the boss saw him close to Paul, he eventually gave Cinquanta a job to guard and take care of Paul. After the raid, Chase returned to meet J. Paul Getty and informed him of the misinformation he had received. He suggested that Getty should now be brave enough to pay the ransom for Paul because he believed the person who bought Paul was not ordinary. Unfortunately, J. Paul Getty remained distrustful and stated there was no money set aside. Most frustratingly, while other family members were preoccupied with the kidnapping case, J. Paul Getty was transacting a painting deal worth $1.5 million. After months of captivity, Paul's condition was chaotic. Cinquanta even had to encourage him to eat the food provided. When the guards were partying, Paul took the opportunity to start a fire and break through the back door. Cinquanta realized and saw Paul running, but deliberately let him go. Only when Paul was far enough away did Cinquanta announce there was a fire. Paul, feeling his escape was far enough, tried to flag down a car and was fortunate to meet the police, who took him to the local police station. Not wanting to wait, he immediately called his mother to pick him up. However, when Gail asked where the police station was, the call suddenly dropped. The next day, Gail remembered a statue worth $1.2 million that J. Paul Getty had once given to his son. Without delay, she went to sell it. At the auction house, she was shocked to learn it was a tourist trinket. Disbelieving, Gail went to a museum to verify, and indeed the statue was only worth $15. This, of course, left her extremely frustrated and surprised that her father-in-law could deceive her like that. Meanwhile, in a faint state, the kidnappers cruelly cut off Paul's ear to send as a warning to a news office. The news office planned to publish a photo of Paul's ear in their newspaper, and as compensation, they would pay $50,000. Initially reluctant, Gail agreed and requested payment in the form of 1,000 copies of the newspaper to be sent directly to the Getty residence. It turns out this caught J. Paul Getty's attention, and in a meeting he revealed that he would pay the ransom for Paul. However, the ransom for Paul was to be a loan to his son, and as payment, Gail had to surrender custody of Paul to his father. Seeing the disheveled and bewildered state of Paul's father, Gail was understandably upset. But what could she do? This was the only way to save her son. The problem didn't end there. Different tax laws meant that Gail could only receive $1 million, leaving her utterly confused. Moreover, Cinquanta demanded a ransom of $4 million, which was the absolute maximum he could manage. Out of pity, he advised Gail to pay quickly, because if not, he couldn't do anything if the Mafia did something even worse. In her confusion, Gail finally got the idea to announce that she had all the ransom money, amounting to $4 million. J. Paul Getty, who witnessed this, was immediately astonished and called Fletcher Chase to face him. Getty directly questioned where Gail could have gotten the ransom money, and if Chase didn't tell, Getty threatened to fire him. Chase, irritated by Getty's presumptuous talk, couldn't contain his frustration. 
He stated that everything Getty owned up to that point was thanks to him, from the security system to the guards and other things. He had designed and managed it all. Before leaving, he told Getty that he might have all the money in the world, but it would mean nothing if he continued to live like that. Upon arriving in Rome, Chase received news that Getty had sent the full ransom amount of $3.3 million. Without delay, once the money was collected, the exchange plan began immediately. Gale was instructed to go south and leave the money in the middle of the forest, then head to a gas station at the end of the road to wait for further instructions. While the kidnappers counted the ransom money, Cinquanta was seen with a friend delivering Paul to a location. He advised Paul to run and leave Italy immediately. After counting the ransom money, they called Gail and instructed her to meet Paul at a nearby construction site. However, when she arrived, Paul was no longer there because after being dropped off, he had run away. When the mafia leader was about to leave with all the money, he heard from his men that the police had surrounded him. This made him furious, and he ordered his men to kill Paul immediately. Meanwhile, Paul kept running through the increasingly deserted city. When he was almost caught, but fortunately, Cinquanta was there and saved him. Then Chase arrived and recognized that it was Cinquanta. Cinquanta again insisted that Chase take Paul out of Italy. Back at his home, J. Paul Getty suddenly woke up from his sleep, looking very restless. In his fear, he ran to call his assistant, but unfortunately, his grand house was now empty. All that remained was the silence and loneliness of his magnificent building, which seemed no longer alive. In his despair, Getty took the last painting he had bought, and shortly after, the wealthiest old man in the world passed away in his comfortable chair. The next day, Gale was called to be Getty's successor until his heirs, his children, were grown and ready to run it. With the inheritance, they eventually created the Getty Museum in Los Angeles and donated part of their wealth to charity. The movie ends. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. Because by subscribing, you have supported me to make better videos. See you in the next video.